I'm not ashamed. What was Israel to do with their Hebrew slaves after six years? This is the question that we seek to answer today as we continue our verse by verse study of the book of Deuteronomy on walking through the Bible. If you have a Bible with him, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 15. We're going to be reading from verses 12 to 23. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry. Just follow along with us on the screen. The version that we'll be reading from is the New King James Version. So Deuteronomy 15, beginning of verse 12. If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you and serves you six years, then in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. And when you send him away free from you, you shall not let him go away empty-handed. You shall supply him liberally from your flock, from your threshing floor, and from your winepress. From what the Lord has blessed you with, you shall give to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore I command you this thing today. And if it happens that he says to you, I will not go away from you, because he loves you and your house, since he prospers with you, then you shall take an awl and thrust it through his ear to the door, and he shall be your servant forever. Also to your female servant you shall do likewise. It shall not seem hard to you when you send him away free from you, for he has been worth a double hired servant in serving you six years. Then the Lord your God will bless you in all that you do. All the firstborn males that come from your herd and your flock you shall sanctify to the Lord your God, you shall do no work with the firstborn of your herd, nor shear the firstborn of your flock. You and your household shall eat it before the Lord your God year by year in the place which the Lord chooses. But if there is a defect in it, if it is lame or blind or has any serious defect, you shall not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. You may eat it within your gates. The unclean and the clean person alike may eat it, as if it were a gazelle or a deer. Only you shall not eat his blood. You shall pour it out on the ground." like water. In this chapter, we've already dealt with how Israel was to treat their brethren, especially the poor. If you recall back in Leviticus 25, God had proclaimed that every seventh year was a year of rest for the land, and no crops were to be planted or harvested. In that year, those who depended on crops for not only food but money would have a problem paying debts that they owed. Therefore, God told the Israelite creditors that during this seventh year they weren't to collect debts from their brethren. They were allowed to collect debts from foreigners, but not their brethren. God even went so far to say that creditors weren't to think that as the seventh year approached, that they would simply not lend to the poor, for that was a wicked thought since God was going to richly bless them if they kept his commandments. God also said that if they kept his commandments, they would be so rich that they would lend to other nations and rule over other nations instead of those nations ruling over them. This promise was, of course, conditional on Israel's obedience, and so in many sections of the Old Testament, we don't see this promise fulfilled due to Israel's idolatry. Coming now to verses 12 to 23, we approach a topic that many think the Bible and God is just plain wrong on, and that is the topic of slavery. When we think of slavery, we often think of the brutal slavery that existed for millennia, slavery that God never condoned. But lest we think that even in Western culture we have gotten rid of slavery, let's think again. If you have a loan, you are a slave to your lender. No, they may not beat you or treat you brutally, but they control your life until you pay back the loan. When we read of slavery, even in Israel, the slavery we're often reading of is slavery that came to pass because someone needed to pay a debt, and so offered to pay off their debt through slave labor. Whatever the reason for slavery, though, God expected their masters to treat the servants humanely, as is evidenced by what we find here in Deuteronomy 15. In verses 12 to 18 of Deuteronomy 15, we find an expansion of the laws found in Exodus 21, 1 to 11. How was Israel to treat a Hebrew slave, no matter if that slave was a man or a woman? They were allowed to keep that slave for six years, but they must be released in the seventh year. And not only that, when they are freed, they were to be supplied with liberally from the master's flock, threshing floors, and winepress. Why? Because the Lord had richly blessed them, and because they needed to remember that they were slaves in the land of Egypt, yet came out with many possessions. Now, if the slave does not want to leave, 
Then they were to take an awl and thrust it through the servant's ear to the door, and the servant would be the master's forever. Note, though, that it was the servant's choice, not the master's choice, as to whether the servant desired to stay. In being commanded to let the Hebrew servants go after six years of service, and then send them away with abundance, God was not imposing too much on Israel, for when they had the servants for six years, it had the value of a double hired servant. In other words, in having the servant, they saved more than enough money, not only to redeem the servant, but to send them away with abundance. Coming now to verses 19 to 23, we find again the laws concerning the firstborn animals. All the way back in Exodus 13, we found that the firstborn males among the animals was to be consecrated to the Lord. As such, they were to do no work with these animals, nor shear these animals for wool. They were to, make, they were to take it to the place where the tabernacle was, and their household was to offer it to the Lord as a sacrifice and eat a sacrificial meal with their family there. That the one offering the sacrifice also was to eat of the meat seems to be at odds with Numbers 18.18, which said that the meat was to be eaten by the priests. While many explanations have been given to explain this supposed discrepancy, the easiest way to think about it is this. Like with a couple other things in Deuteronomy, God modified the law to be observed once Israel entered Canaan. It's not that the priests were forbidden to eat of the meat, it's just that the family of the one offering the sacrifice was to be included as well just like in the peace offerings. If the animal had any defect, though, it wasn't to be offered as a sacrifice to God, but neither was it to be used. Instead, it may be eaten within the gates, just like any other animal that couldn't be sacrificed. The only stipulation was that the blood couldn't be eaten of. With that, our time is up for today. Lord willing, we hope you'll join us for tomorrow's discussion of Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 1 to 8, as we continue our walk through the Bible. One verse at a time. I'm not a Thank you for watching today's episode. We hope that you found it edifying and ask that you not only subscribe to our channel and podcast, but that you like and share this episode among your friends so that the saving gospel of Jesus Christ can go out to the whole world.